So I'd love to start by going back. Your mother was a best-selling novelist and your father was an inventor. Um, talk us through some of your early influences and experiences that shaped you as the businesswoman you are today. Um, yeah, well that's, that is a lovely place to start. My mum was a, she was a novelist, Penny Vincenzi. She wrote 16 best-selling novels and we lost quite a count of her sales at something like 7 million books. So she was quite something to follow, but she was, she was a wonderful, wonderful woman and she brought a kind of flavour of um, ambition and opportunity to our kind of household and yeah and I spent my goodness me my childhood in you know magazine office because she was also a journalist magazine offices um just you know falling in love with the whole culture of women's magazines and publishing and feminism as it was at that time and so on um and then um, my dad yes so he was a he was uh, worked in advertising and then um in he, he became more of an inventor when when he retired but he, um, he was amazing. He was just so empowering and encouraging and just thought we were the most you know, wonderful things for creatures on earth. <laughs> what amazing role models. Um, and you, in many ways, followed your mum's footsteps. You went into journalism, um, you were a beauty writer and editor on magazines. So what is it that made you start Not On The High Street back in 2006? Correct, yes. Um, I think... Yeah, that's right. I started on, on magazines, which is just, I loved and had some more fabulous role models there um, in the editors of those, of those magazines. Um, I think what led to Not On The High Street was probably, I'd worked in magazines, I'd worked in advertising, I'd worked in some dot-com startups. I always had this entrepreneurial itch that I really wanted to scratch. Um, and... I had my two children and it was that kind of moment of reflection where, you know, what is this, is this my time, is this the moment? Um, I'd been working with my business partner Holly Tucker and we came up with this kind of, what seemed like a kind of amazing kind of light bulb moment, a real pain. When, when, when Holly first kind of talked with me about taking small businesses online, I had this real penny dropping down the back, back of your neck kind of moment and thinking how extraordinary that was. So I was, you know, I was just so, so, so excited about that. And then the market was all going there in our favour. The internet was booming. Um, the small, you know, the kind of culture of small businesses was, was starting to really become something, become a real entity. Um, the high street was declining. It was just, it was a perfect storm. So you had this brilliant idea, perfect storm of, of opportunity. What were some of the big mistakes and challenges you made in those early days of getting the business off the ground? Um, yeah, there were a few. Um, I think the, the biggest, if you can call it a mistake, was sort of naivety and um, optimism and kind of inexperience really, but all those things were good things because they meant that we were, um, you know, we were kind of really willing to try something that was borderline impossible because what we were trying to do was build technology that didn't really exist, um, a platform that hadn't happened before, you know, so on and so But um, yeah, mistakes, well one big mistake, which I definitely don't recommend, is um, we put a countdown, we had this kind of microsite as our kind of pre-launch site, we had this kind of, so we put a countdown, a, a, I think it was a 60 day countdown, that to our launch, which we thought would be really exciting. Build up excitement. <laughs> Build up excitement, <laughs> start some momentum. And um, yeah, that wasn't a good idea, because as the date got nearer and nearer, and we realised that we just weren't ready, it became absolutely petrifying and started to sort of haunt us. And we were like, can we set this back? Can we, can we re reset it? <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> um, so it brought this kind of incredible pressure to launch. And then the other mistakes that we made, I mean, so many over the years, but around launch, I think a another one that um, it was, was a good learning lesson for us, and we actually turned to our advantage, was that we, the, the company that we trusted to build our site and our checkout, um, just it just it emerged, you know, towards the towards this launch date that they were, weren't going to be able to do it. So we we were about to launch a website, a shopping website, without a checkout. You couldn't buy anything. <laughs> 
Um, and so we just had to spin it and we, we called it a preview. We had loads of publicity already scheduled because of our media background and we were able to get publicity, which seemed like a great thing, again, until we were launching with Elder Checkout. Um, <laughs> But we called it a preview and we said register for a thousand pounds, I think, to spend on this, or to win, you know, the chance to win a thousand pounds to spend on the site another day. And um, hope for the best. And what happened was, because of all this publicity, because people couldn't buy anything, they did register. And we built a really big database that day. And we never would have done that. We never would have started with a big database if we hadn't made that. Yeah, so you really use some of those um, mistakes to your advantage. Yeah. Um, during those really stressful early days, um, it must have been really helpful having a co-founder. Mm -hmm. we, we talked a little bit this morning about the kind of loneliness of an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, what would be your advice on making business partnerships work? Yeah, I'm a big fan of partnerships. I, I, I think I agree. It's a lonely. It's, I see lots of people work alone successfully, of course, but I think it's 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 also quite a lonely thing to do. Um, I think the yeah. I think two two main things really. One is it's a you know recognise that who you know as a friend and personally is very different from who you know as a professional and working together. And you must get some experience of working together or knowing how somebody works before you commit. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and the other one I would say is um, get some kind of agreement in place. Like the business equivalent of a prenup. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and even if it's not legally binding, you've been forced to go through and look someone in the eye and say, you know, I want to sell in five years, or I don't want to share the decision making on X, or whatever it is. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be legally binding, but it, it really is, I think, a very valuable thing to do. In terms of your growth journey, I wanted to talk to you about funding. I know you went through several rounds of venture capital. Um, you said you faced sexism, jokes and patronising comments from potential investors who dismissed us as a couple of mums doing arts and crafts. Wow. Um, it's still really tough for female entrepreneurs in particular to get funding at the moment, I think it's less than 2% of all VC goes to female-run businesses. Um, so what would be your advice to people who are pitching for investment? Um, yeah, I mean, that is, that, um, sadly that's true. I like to think, I mean, I think you're right, it could still be that way. I like to think that, that 16 years ago as it was, you know, feminism was still a bit of you know, people always kind of said it in hushed, hushed terms. You know, there wasn't a kind of feminist culture even to protect you in that kind of situation. Um, but yes, I think, I think what we learned then, and I think still applies, is um, one, that you, you, know, you need to give yourself plenty of time, so much time, because you will kiss a lot of frogs, and you will meet people who, who, who make you feel you know, like, like uncomfortable taking their money and you don't want to be in a situation where you have to do that because you've got to that point. So I think plenty of time, time to kind of feel your way and choose, you know, choose somebody rather than just sort of thinking you're lucky to have somebody. And then the other thing I think is um, be prepared for a, a very rigorous process. Know your stuff, really know your stuff. Know your numbers, know your brand, know your numbers. Brand numbers, brand numbers, brand numbers. That's, that's, that's the kind of, you know, what you've got to be able to come up with. How did you even find your investors in the first place? Um, well, we did lots of pitches. A lot, I mean, again, there was no crowdfunding. There, was, there were, obviously, um, there was a presence of the uh, VC community online, but it, was, it wasn't what it is today. There weren't all these kind of, um, you know, hot house type organisations and things like that. So yeah, we had to do it very much sort of, you know, um, freestyle. And we asked a lot of people, met everybody we could, but we eventually met um, our investors who, and our, and our own investors, none of them were like that. And I have to say that we work with really good investors, every single one. Um, but the first investors that we worked with who were the investors who wrote the first check for lastminute.com 
Um, and yeah, we just did a pitch with them. They were very different, you know, in the in the kind of dating analogy, they were they felt like the one yeah, from, the from, right fit. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and although it was a tough pitch, um, and we thought we were walking away without without a yes, at the very last minute they kind of kept called us back into the room and said, "We've decided to do it," and it was a it was a big important moment for us. Um, you then went on this extraordinary growth journey with um, NotOnHighStreet.com. When and why did you step back from the business? Mm. Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think it was about 10 years in. I think the, the real why is because it felt like the right time. Um, and I think to be more specific about that, I would say the business had got to a stage where my best game was, was, was not quite a match with what, you know, I'm, I'm an earlier stage person. I love it when you can really get your arms around the business, get your arms around everybody. We, we were, I think we were about, I don't know, 150 people by then. Um, and it felt very different. We had a leadership team that was much more kind of c suite um, And all those things made me feel like this was the time. I have to be completely honest as well. I definitely was struggling personally. It was, it, it, it got very tough. It was 10 years of relentless, relentless work. Um, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time with my children before they were completely grown up. Uh, and yeah, I think um, it, it, was, it, was, it was just the right time. And how hard was it to let go? Again, we said earlier that you know, your, your business is like your baby. So how, how did that kind of impact you personally? And how did you then, you know, business is so closely linked with your own identity. So how did you then go through that sort of transition period? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think I, I, I it, it was both very triumphant and I felt great about it. And I'm a real, you know, I'm a classic completer finisher. So the idea of, you know, starting a business, building a business, exiting a business, selling a business is just like, you know, it's perfect for somebody like me. But within that, yeah, I was giving up what had been my kind of my day and night for 10 years and that and that was that was very tough and there were times of course where I wondered if I'd done the right thing and um, but it was I was ready the business was ready I was ready it was it was the right time and what did you do next you know what made you then return to retail and join Busby and Fox yes um, well, the first thing I did was actually write our second book, so that was quite a nice transition um, to sort of be able to sort of document it all, you know, in retrospect. And I love the way you didn't just go and lie on a beach. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you actually thought, I'm going to write a book now. Yeah, you see, no so that, goes, that goes back to the, you know, the, the family culture. That was how I was raised. It was a kind of crazy work ethic in our family. Um, yes, so, but then eventually I started doing a little bit of, um, I did a kind of quite a big mentoring project. I stayed connected to Not On The High Street. I was still on the board and, and those connections, involvements. Um, but eventually um, I went to Buzzfeed and Fox and started working with um, a very, very dear friend of mine who called Emma Vowles, who was the founder of Buzzfeed and Fox. Um, and yeah, that, 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 was, that was my next, my next chapter.